Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, the show about the future, in particular this year, of American democracy. Our fourth series is focusing on American democracy in the run-up to the November 2022 elections. Uh, in one of our previous episodes, I had a very interesting conversation with Catherine Stewart. She's an authority on the radical religious right in America, and she talks about the way in which this movement seems to be infiltrating every dominant institution politically, particularly uh, in American life. And, and, and we spoke about the way in which the, re the religious right in America is infiltrating the courts and the legal establishment. I wanna focus on that today with my guest, Dahlia uh, Lithwick. She is a very distinguished authority on law. She's the author of a new book, Lady Justice, focusing on women in the law in America. And she's the host of the Amicus podcast on Slate, uh, which focuses on the law. Uh, Dahlia, welcome to How to Fix Democracy. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I saw some uh, nods of recognition when I mentioned uh, uh, Catherine Stewart. Are you familiar with her work? I'm very familiar with her work, and interestingly, just around the time when the Supreme Court last spring uh, was handing down the Dobbs decision, uh, we did at least one, I think maybe two events together because people were desperate to understand how this quasi-theological conversation about life beginning at ensoulment and fetal personhood was coming out of the Supreme Court of the United States. And I think, as you noted, she's one of the best situated people to kind of draw the map to say this is how that happened at this court at this moment. We'd done a lot of talking about the religious right with Catherine Stewart, so I don't want to go over that ground. But I do want to touch on the religious makeup of the Supreme Court. You've written about um, the strong Roman Catholic uh, identity of the court. You're certainly not the first, it's fairly obvious. Is this significant, Dahlia? And is there some sort of connection politically or ideologically between American Roman Catholicism and the broader evangelical movement in America? So I think I would start by saying that you raise the, the single most intractable and thorny issue for court watchers, that historically there have been a lot of moments where people have observed, uh, maybe most famously Jeffrey Stone, uh, who at the time was the dean of Chicago Law School, who noted after a major abortion case came down, he sort of no noted to his chagrin, I have to say this publicly, all five people in the majority were Catholics. I'm going to write this. Justice Scalia, who was alive at the time, was so affronted by the implication that Catholicism somehow inflected uh, the reasoning in that case that he refused to go back and visit the law school. He was really mad. And we t hear time and time and time again when people say the thing that you said to me, which is, is the fact that we have six people who were at least raised Catholic uh, making determinations with a Catholic valence, how can that not be material? And the answer tends to be from the right and the left, by the way, we don't wanna talk about that. You may recall when Amy Coney Barrett was being elevated to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, Dianne Feinstein tried to probe her religious values. She tried to ask about a piece that uh, Barrett had written, an academic piece, and pulled back a bloody stump. From the right and the left, it was seen as inappropriate religious tests and not something that could possibly be probed. So I think that what you are identifying is one of the central problems with the way the court is constituted and how we talk about it, which is clearly religion has some impact on where we are, not just by the way on abortion, but on the religious liberty questions the court is deciding. And nobody feels comfortable talking about it. In fact, it's so frowned upon that I would say it is the third rail 
in Supreme Court uh, conversation, we can talk more readily about a justice's race or sexuality than we can talk about their religion. And that has been the case, by the way, for decades. And it's a huge problem at a moment like this one, where it's quite clear that religion has at least something to do with the doctrine that the court is producing. Uh, the moment, of course, uh, Dahlia, that you're talking about is a post-America Dobbs versus Jackson court where Roe versus Wade was overturned. Uh, as we talk, uh, there's still all sorts of permutations that may play themselves out by the time uh, people hear this conversation. Uh, you've done a lot of writing about the way in which this decision undermined the credibility of the U.S. Supreme Court. Does that reflect a weakness, a crisis in American democracy, or does the makeup of the Supreme Court reflect that crisis? Or are they so hard to separate that you put those two things together and they speak of a, a, a significant problem with the future of American democracy? I think that the simple answer is that, of course, the makeup of the court is the court, uh, that the fact that the court, as it is currently constituted, uh, is not reflective of not just that it's misaligned with polling, the justices would tell you, we don't care about the polls, we were designed, right, we are protected, we have life appointments, we are protected from term renewals, exactly because we don't care about the polls. That's how we got Brown versus Board of Education. So the justices would tell you it doesn't matter that the public opinion around the court has plummeted in the past two years. They might even say, and I think Justice Alito has been uh, apt to say versions of, that means they're doing their job, right? They're completely blind to what the public wants. So I think the answer I would give you is the structural answer which is that the current Supreme Court has five of the six conservative justices were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote and then uh, confirmed by Senate that is so wildly malapportioned that West Virginia has the same representation as California. So then you have in effect a minority rule president under the electoral college, a minority rule Senate under the malapportioned Senate seating Supreme Court justices who are then, and this is key, I think, to your question, working very hard in Citizens United to really, really warp democracy, working really hard in the Shelby County case to kill the Voting Rights Act, and then to do, again, the same thing in the Brnovich case. So what I'm trying to describe to you is only almost completely closed loop, wherein the machinery of minority rule seats a bunch of justices who then work very hard tirelessly, whether it's partisan gerrymandering or political gerrymandering or the independent state legislature theory, which is coming before the court this fall, to make sure that one person, one vote is not the law, to make sure that voting rights are constricted. That is a crisis for majority, and it's entirely separate from who is sitting on the court. It is just, I think, a doom loop we're in right now, and people don't see it because it seems so technical, but the court is not at present ensuring that the constitution is being protected. They are ensuring that the machinery of minority rule is being protected, not just because they're seated on the basis of minority rule, but that they are working in concert with a whole bunch of really big money that we don't know about to shrink the vote. And that is, I think, a, a real crisis for democracy. Well, we know about some of the money. You've, you've written about uh, Leonard Leo, uh, Catherine Stewart talked to me about it. How much of all this, uh, uh, how much of all this, Dahlia, is a plot? A conspiracy to take over the what the old Mar what the Marxists used to call the commanding heights of the American uh, p political establishment, the political architecture. Um, that there are no secrets. I mean, many people have have written. Some people even sympathetic to the right that that this latest assault, if that's the right word, or takeover of the court is the result of 20, 30, 40 years of planning. Uh, nobody does better work on this in my mind than Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who's been making this argument for over a decade now, essentially laying out 
uh, the plot that you're describing. You know, the court that opens the spigot to dark money has then opened the spigot to allow someone like Leonard Leo to not only seat who he wants to seat on the court and to buy state Supreme Court elections, but then the court is itself, as I said, involved in the efforts to say, oh, we're going to do away with, you know, uh, uh, limits on dark money. We're going to do away uh, with uh, efforts to oversee partisan gerrymandering. And I think that the simple, simple answer to your question is it is much cheaper to buy the courts than to win votes. And whether you're looking at millions of dollars that now pour into state Supreme Court races, those used to be anodyne little races, nobody cared. Now we have big out of state money mm. pouring into capturing state Supreme Courts. And as you noted, millions of dollars of untraceable dark money that pours into campaigns, for instance, to keep Merrick Garland off the court, uh, with a completely fanciful claim that he was against Second Amendment gun rights when he had never, ever written a word about the Second Amendment. So I think that the answer is, if you're going to be utterly cynical, whether you call it a plot or a conspiracy, it's just really cheap. It doesn't take that much money to subvert democracy by way of the judicial branch, as opposed to trying to subvert democracy by way of the elected branches. And as you say, that's been a plan that's been in the work for decades. Could all this, though, be a, a critique of progressives that they haven't put their money where their mouths are, or they've simply failed in this battle? I know you use in your, in your new book, Lady Justice, a lot of metaphors of war. I mean, when progressives talk about Soros money or Gates money or Silicon Valley money, they, they don't call it dark money. It's simply money dedicated to making the world a better place. Shouldn't ultimately, aren't progressives responsible for failing to counter in this great chess game? Peter Thiel, one of the great financiers of the right, is a master chess player. And haven't, hasn't the right simply outplayed the left when it comes to the great game of chess in controlling the American democratic state? No, no dispute that for decades, while this plan was being enacted, you know, brick by brick from the political right wing, I think you're quite correct. Progressives and Democrats were asleep at the switch. They were not only unable to plan sort of long-term, decades-long campaigns, but they also had these utterly siloed campaigns. They said, we're going to work on labor. We're going to work on women's rights. We're going to work on LGBTQ movement uh, without understanding that if you lose the courts, all of those victories are entirely ephemeral. And you're also right, and I think Jane Mayer has done so much work on this in her books yeah. and in articles at The New Yorker to sort of say, it's not super hard for the Koch brothers, for instance, the Mercers, other uh, uh, families that simply want to buy democracy and, and shape it to their own will. It's not hard to buy a think tank. It's not hard to buy a chair, uh, an endowed chair at a university. It's not hard to pour out studies that deny climate change. So as you said, this was, I think, very much a foot race to the outcome we're at right now, <laughs> where the court is in some sense utterly bought and sold. And it's a foot race in which conservatives had a 40 year, I would submit, head start. And so if the critique is Democrats are mad because they're bad at this or they were too late to the party, I think that critique is valid. I think the meta question you're asking is, is any of this good for democracy, whether the left is doing it or the right is doing it? And I would suggest that the reason that Citizens United decision in 2020, 2010 was one of the most hated across the boards by partisan decisions in American Supreme Court history is because nobody thinks it's good for democracy for a handful of billionaires to control outcomes. And so I am 100% with you on both your, you know, sort of minor question and your major question. Yes, Democrats were very late to the party and now they are losing. And two, yes, it is horrible for democracy, whether you're a Soros or a Gates or a Mercer or a Koch, that a handful of people control outcomes at this level. That's simply bad. There are ways to repair it, 
Eric Holder is somebody who's thinking about this really hard in his post attorney general career. But I do think that I'm not here to say Democrats should be better at buying the courts. I'm here to say the courts should not be for sale. I use the metaphor of chess. To what extent are Alito and Amy Coney Barrett and the other conservative justices, to what extent are they pawns in this game versus kings or queens? Do they know what they're playing? Do they even understand that they're participating in this great game of a, perhaps destroying American democracy? Or have they rewritten the story in their own mind and believe that they are somehow working on behalf of American democracy? It's such a, a deep question. And I think in one sense, it goes to your original framing, which was the legitimacy of the court itself. Because, you know, as your uh, listeners know, the court has no army. The court has no budget. If Congress decided to turn off the lights and stop the toilets in the court buildings tomorrow, the Congress could do that. The only I have to part- jump in here, though. Uh, I get into trouble for interrupting, but I can't resist here, uh, Dahlia. Stalin famously talked about the Pope as not having an army, but that didn't necessarily undermine his power. Well, so this is, I guess, the second half of the the sentence is that the court has immense power, as we're all seeing, right? We are enthralled to the world that the court has constructed, whether it's affirmative action, as I said, whether it's voting rights, whether it's women's reproductive freedom, whether it's gun rights, we all live in the court's world. And so they have both immense power and utterly limited power. And the crux of that is that the court's power is 100% located by design, this is in the Federalist Papers, in the court's legitimacy. If the American people simply said, nah, we don't want to do it, there is nothing the justices could do to enforce their will, right? That's how we get Little Rock. (laughs) That's how we get the famous story about the Trail of Tears, right? Uh, Or, uh, or, uh, Or Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I mean, the court can only say what they say, and the American people agree. And Justice Stephen Breyer, who's just stepped down, wrote a a, a book, he's written several books, making this claim that we don't understand how fragile that is, that the American people could have taken to the streets after the 2000 election when the court handed it to uh, to Bush instead of Gore, and the American people didn't. Why? Not because the court has power the way you're thinking of, you know, the, the power, but because of public legitimacy. And so when the justices squander that, when they go from 70% popularity ratings to 30% popularity ratings, when the justices decide things as they've been doing on the shadow docket without explaining them, when the justices uh, issue opinions in which they more or less snicker into their sleeves and say, look, American women, if you don't like Dobbs, get out there and vote. At the same time, they're making it harder and harder and harder to vote. The American public is going to respond at that soft spot, which is legitimacy. And that, I think, is the thing that I don't understand when you ask me, you know, what are the justices thinking? When you squander that legitimacy, when you fly to the McConnell Center, as Amy Coney Barrett did last year, and give a speech when you're practically sitting on his lap petting him, that's squandering legitimacy. When Clarence Thomas's wife is involved in the January 6th insurrection, and he doesn't recuse himself from a case directly materially affecting that, that's squandering the court's legitimacy. And so I think just to your big, big question about what the justices are thinking, I do think that at present they must believe that they are returning us to a democracy as imagined by the framers in which women have no power and people of color have no power and wealth, wealthy white men and minority rule uh, you know, is the, the, the law of the land and that's all good. But what I don't understand is how it is that they can do so without realizing that they are dealing a mortal wound to the legitimacy of the court. And I think as Justice Breyer has warned in his book, that doesn't come back easily. That's decades, decades of repair work to get that back. And so I guess they just don't care because it would be so very easy to not give partisan speeches the way Justice Alito did in Rome. It would be so very easy for Clarence Thomas to say, you know what, my wife is a material participant in the issue before the court, I will recuse. It would be so very easy time and time again to not press the, the, the accelerator as opposed to pumping the brakes. 
But what we've seen is an almost out of control court that has decided it's gonna make change, big change fast because it can. And if the American public doesn't like it, oh well, too bad, so sad. And that part I cannot explain to you because I cannot fathom what they think they're doing. Some observers have suggested in the, that the court's attack on the right for women to abortion, there's some sort of return to um, an attack on sexuality itself. We had um, on this show at the beginning of the year, the great Canadian writer, you're also from Canada, Margaret Atwood, talking about Handmaid's Tale, her dystopian future, which doesn't seem that far off in America, of a place where sex or at least eroticism is banned. Um, how do you make sense of the Dobbs case in the context of, let's put it, American cultural democratic history? Is it a return to this attack on sexuality, perhaps on Black sexuality, since it's Black women who are going to be punished more than any others in this new post-Roe versus Wade world? I think that's exactly right. And I think in some sense, the word return is a misnomer because it has always been the case, particularly for Black women, that their sexuality is in doubt, is questioned, is criminalized, um, is used for economic purposes, right? The, I, I would commend to folks the work of Professor Dorothy Roberts, who's written several phenomenal books on the topic. In some sense, I think the lesson of Dobbs is that for white women, they are having a return. And for many women of color and poor women, uh, it is exactly the status quo, which has always been the status quo, even when Roe v. Wade was the law. One of the most important conversations I had after Dobbs, after the, the oral argument in Dobbs, was with Professor Catherine Frankie at Columbia University on my podcast, who reminded me that if you were a, a woman in Mississippi or Alabama or Tennessee, you never really had a right to terminate your pregnancy. It was always post Hyde Amendment, subject to the ability to raise funds, subject to the ability to travel, subject to the ability to have childcare. And so what we saw in Dobbs was that in some sense, a great leveling <laughs> where now you can see across the country, white women and black women and women of color, women, women on uh, Indian reservations, all uh, subject to the same constraints. And I do think it goes to your point, which is women's sexuality has been regulated by the state from time immemorial. It is no accident that Justice Alito in his Dobbs opinion cites people like Sir Matthew Hale, who wrote with approval of witch burnings, right? I mean, this goes back long before the fact. I don't know why I'm laughing because I should be crying, really. No, it, it's not funny, but I think it tells you where they locate some of these ideas. And so it, you are absolutely right that this goes to quintessential questions of bodily autonomy, of dignity, of freedom. There's phenomenal briefing in the Dobbs case about women's economic opportunity if they can't control their fertility. And none of it, none of it uh, mattered uh, to the majority. Maybe the last thing I will say, because I think this is so salient in this context, is that Justice Alito just kind of bats away in the Dobbs opinion, this notion of substantive due process, that women have some right to bodily autonomy, to the management of their families and their children, which parenthetically is the claim that is being used now to do away with critical race theory in schools in Texas and Florida, right? That you have this fundamental right to raise your family the way you would see fit. He says, oh, that, you know, the word abortion isn't in the constitution, bodily autonomy isn't in the constitution. But the reason that those ideas about family privacy and autonomy were built into the 13th and 14th Amendment was because after chattel slavery, when the 14th and 13th Amendment were drafted, it was understood by abolitionists that the only way to make sure that former slaves were free was to give them back control of their bodies, to say nobody can rape you. Nobody can separate you from your spouse. Nobody can take your children away as units of economic uh, 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 boon to themselves. That's what the 13th and 14th Amendment tried to protect. The notion that your body and your family and your children are inherent in anyone's notion of freedom. And so when Justice Alito just says, there's no such thing, 
What he's really saying is that what the framers of the 13th and 14th Amendment defined as quintessential freedom for former slaves, which is the ability to decide who your children are, who to have them with, how to raise them, none of that matters. And for someone who holds himself out as a historian, that's an astounding place to land. Your new book, Lady Justice, one of the, the lady justices that you write about, Stacey Abrams, one of America's uh, foremost fighters for the right to vote, um, based, of course, in Georgia. Another very influential, famous Georgian is Carol Anderson, professor at Emory University. She's been on the show a couple of times. Georgia's an important place. We also did a show with... Um, with Andrea Young, uh, the head of the ACLU uh, in Georgia. Um, how do you connect, Dahlia, the fight to vote, which Stacey Abrams and Carol Anderson and Andrea Young are all focused on, and the broader issue of sexual freedom? It seems as if, and I don't want to discriminate here, but it seems as if Black women get this better than others? Maybe they've seen it up close. I, I love that question. One of my favorite moments in all my years of podcasting was having Carol Anderson, who, as you say, wrote, uh, you know, One Person No Vote, which was, in a sense, a canary in the coal mine of what vote suppression was going to bring us to long before I think anyone else was focused on it. And one of the things Carol said to me about voting is exactly what I just uh, recited to you about women and abortion, which is if you thought that you could just drive up to a polling place and flash an ID and vote in 30 seconds, you were never a black person voting in Georgia. And that just as the right to an abortion was ephemeral in Tennessee, the right to vote was always ephemeral if you were a black person, particularly in a Southern state. And she was the one who reminded me, and this again was before the 2020 election, before even the 2016 election, white people need to learn to vote like they're black. They need to understand they may have to stand in line. They may have to bring a battery charger and something to eat and uh, some water. They're not even allowed to take water anymore. Right? Well, you're certainly, the... you're not allowed to give them water in Georgia. And that's one of the things <laughs> she was warning us about. But I think it goes to this idea that we have such magical thinking about rights. We think that they're just self-enforcing and that they're made of stone and steel. And so many rights are just paper rights and they are as strong as our ability to enforce them, to act together to enforce them. And so I think that the answer to the question is what's the nexus between you know, women who woke up after the Dobbs decision and said, how could this happen? How can I live in a country where this happened it all goes back to voting and it all goes back to that conversation we had about minority rule. And so I think if women like Stacey Abrams and Carol Anderson and people like Nina Perales in my book, and I would submit so many women of color, AOC, who've been saying we all need to live as though democracy matters, as though the fight for democracy itself is existential, then that's who we have to be listening to right now. And let's not forget Sherilyn Eiffel, the former head of the NAACP mm. Legal Defense Fund, always reminds me every time that this has always been a fight if you were a person of color. Now we all see it and we get it. And so now we have to really double down and understand that, that you know Black women and women of color organizing in Georgia gave those two Senate seats to Joe Biden in 2020. They will do it again in the midterms, I hope. But we all have to look around and see that, again, just caring about the environment, just caring about labor, just caring about you know trans athletes, every one of those things is essential. But there's no way to protect those things unless the right to vote is top of mind for all of us every day, all the time, now and forever. You use the word fight metaphorically, both in this conversation and in your book. But of course, there are many people, and we plan to have conversations on this show about it, who believe that America is on the brink, if not in civil war right now. Um, what, in your view, are the chances of all this turning violent? And what's 
the relationship between violence and the court, because, of course, the court is presented as the most civil of all civil organizations in America. But it sounds to me from what you're saying is that some of the Supreme Court justices, particularly perhaps Alito, are themselves uh, perpetrating at least the language of violence. I think that that's it's an astute comment. It is no accident that fencing, six foot fencing has been up around the court building since the spring. It actually only just came down. It's no accident that leak itself, unprecedented in American history, the leak of the Dobbs opinion in the spring is an act of violence upon the court. And as we suggested, no accident that um, one of the justices spouses was involved in at least helping organize what became a massive act of violence on January 6th. Can I just jump in? What, you, you keep on talking about that as a, an act of violence. You also talked about s- civil disobedience in this conversation. Some people on the right might suggest that January 6th was in an American tradition of fighting an unjust state. How would you respond to that? Um, I mean, I think that there's just simple criminal and civil convictions that now we are seeing up and down, you know, the chain of involvement that suggests that if you are destroying property, if you are, you know, taking uh, uh, control of Congress in order to stop an election from being certified, you have long passed the definition of civil disobedience. You are into the world of lawless violence. And I think we are seeing the indictments and the convictions that kind of say there's a bright line between those two activities. And I think it's very, very uh, alluring to try to say, oh, those were freedom fighters and they were just protesting for freedom. But when they're chanting, hang my pants, and destroying the offices of members of Congress, I don't think that Mike Pence would say that was just lawful civil disobedience. But I will say just on the larger question of violence, one of the things I've been writing about almost for a year, and it goes to your, your kind of questions about lawlessness and where we are, The most intriguing thing about SB8, and that was the Texas abortion rule that predated Dobbs, that essentially nullified Roe v. Wade in the state of Texas and said, we don't care what the line of viability is, we're gonna allow anybody to bring a civil suit in Texas and stop someone from having an abortion. And you may recall just around this time last year, the Supreme Court signed off on that. And they did it by the way, in an unsigned shadow docket order that did not tell us its reasoning. The thing that worried me about SB8 was that it felt like it was the court giving a green light to vigilantism. SB8 didn't empower the state to enforce its new abortion rules. It empowered people in Cleveland and Kentucky to bring civil lawsuits. And I put SB8 in a line of things like Kyle Rittenhouse, in a line of things like the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin, the gun case, where uh, the justices suggest that everybody on the New York City subways should be packing heat because that's what makes us free. And the thread in everything we're talking about, including, by the way, your question about January 6th, is what happens when Donald Trump with his language and Lindsey Graham with his language and the Supreme Court with their language seem to be not just enabling, but celebrating vigilantism. The notion that doesn't matter what the law says, you get to be the arbiter of what is lawful. And by the way, here's your gun. And that is a strain that I see lashing together so many of the themes we're talking today about lawlessness. Because when Donald Trump says, you know, the Proud Boys should just, you know, stand by and stand down. Or when Lindsey Graham says there will be, you know, a civil war on the streets if an indictment comes for Donald Trump. Or if Ruby Freeman is being an election worker, is being harassed in her home by people who have been products of what, you know, Juliet Kayyem and others called stochastic terror. The idea that you just say these words, put these violent ideas out there and someone will act on them. I do think, and I'm sorry to say this in answer to your question, that the court is absolutely putting a thumb on the scale for the idea that if you don't like systems, you can take the law into your own hand. I think SB8 was very emblematic of that. And I think the court landing on both Dobbs, as you say, and Bruin, the gun case, 
is a theme that continues to really worry me. Not just that, you know, people are talking about civil war and that there are profound disagreements. There have always been profound disagreements, but that blessing lawlessness and vigilantism to me feels new. Could have almost been written by Kafka or something, Dahlia. Um, uh, a country descends into lawlessness enabled by a Supreme Court of law. And I would add maybe one coda, and my colleague Mark Joseph Stern and I wrote this a few times at the end of the term. One of the ways that I see this materializing is in, because you asked about whether the justices do this intentionally or whether this is inadvertent. In case after case, particularly around the COVID orders, particularly around, you know, school districts trying to make determinations about whether someone could lawfully pray at a football game the language dripping with contempt for licensing officials, for school attorneys, the dripping contempt for health scientists who are trying to make their best guesses about what's safe in a pandemic, time and time again, whether it's Neil Gorsuch, whether it's Sam Alito, whether it's Brett Kavanaugh, you hear government lawyers, government workers talked about with this contemptuous sort of, I mean, it's not just Kafka, it's like the office, you know, it's really a grim batting away of all these government bureaucrats as though they're part of either the deep state or they're just useless. And I watched it time and again, directed at environmental officials, as I said, school officials, health officials, that kind of language, the notion that the entire superstructure of government workers is in on some fix to take away your freedom, that shouldn't be coming. I don't think it should be a part of political discourse at all. I understand that's where we are. But when it's coming from inside the house, when it's justices themselves saying that the guy who's licensing whether or not you have a gun or the guy who's deciding whether or not public health measures are lawful is just some hack, that's really bone chilling Kafka as turn that I'm not sure people clock this year. Well, you talked about dark clouds earlier, Dahlia. You created some of your own. Let's end <laughs> uh, on some sort of note or potential for optimism. The show is called How to Fix Democracy. What are we supposed to do here, uh, Dahlia? Are we supposed to fund or get behind a Soros to fight the uh, you know, the, the Leonard Leos of the world? Should we simply be turning out as Carol Anderson or, or, or Stacey Abrams is suggesting in, in November? W what are the fixes here? I, I'm so glad you asked that because it is, my producer of my podcast says, I'm not just an Eeyore. She says, I'm a broken Tigger. And she says, those are the worst sorts of dark clouds because we really, you know, used to sort of bound through life, uh, enjoying democracy. And now, sort of spread some worry. And I am not here to spread worry. I would not be citing Sherilyn Eiffel and Carol Anderson, nor would you if I thought this was hopeless. But I do think there's two pieces of it. And one piece we're already seeing, which is post Dobbs, whether you're looking at the Kansas referendum, you know, women signing up to vote for un unbelievable numbers for, you know, just midterm elections, people registering, people door knocking, people really showing up skin in the game to vote and to have their voices been heard, be heard. And I think that is one through line here that we kind of let democracy go on screen save. We figured it was sorting itself out and that realizing that every single person is gonna have to pick up a paddle and row, I think has been a huge, row I guess being an interesting play on word, but yeah. it's been a huge, R-O-W rather than R-O-E, right? R-O-W. And I think that has been a huge lesson of this year. And then I think the second one, and this is going to, I know people are going to be like, la, 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 but it's democracy repair. It's fixing the Electoral Count Act. It's fixing the Electoral College. It is fixing the malapportioned Senate. It is adding seats to the court and stripping jurisdiction if need be and term limits for justice. So the big picture work of ensuring that, by the way, a system that was designed to promote minority rule by the framers, that's, that was the point. That's why we had the electoral college. That's why uh, we have a malapportioned Senate. All of that is fixable and good people are doing the work to fix it right now. 
but it's not going to fix itself. And so I guess on both the meta and micro level, it is about every single person showing up and owning a piece of it. That means showing up for the midterms, yes, but it also means if you don't like the way the Senate is malapportioned, there are things that can be done, but we gotta do them and not just hope that democracy just springs back. We have learned, I think in the last six years, it doesn't spring back on its own. Well, there you have it, how to fix democracy. Go out and vote. Couldn't be said more clearly or convincingly. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Dahlia, uh, Dahlia Litwack, uh, Litwick, uh, the author of Lady Justice, a um, great authority. I also recommend that people subscribe to your show, Amicus on Slate. Thank you so much for appearing on How to Fix Democracy. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.